Ray, when we talk about time as, uh, as ordinary people, we, we seem to know exactly what it is, and it's, it, it can't be stopped. It flows all the different characteristics. Uh, uh, since Einstein uh, talked about space-time and the unification of space and time, and particularly more recently, uh, many physicists, uh, many friends, uh, now believe that time is unreal in, 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 in one respect or, or another, that time is derivative, that uh, time is, uh, was created or emerged in the Big Bang, space time out of, out of something more primitive. Uh, so time has, be, uh, has been uh, degraded and, and minimalized in its importance. Uh, you've approached time in a radically different perspective. And I'd like to understand what your perspective is and, and why you are uh, a defender of time. I'm a defender of time because one couldn't be anything else. I think it was G. E. Moore once said of McTaggart, this is a chap who says he doesn't believe in the reality of time, but is still prepared to tell me he had his breakfast before his lunch. Of course, physicists feel obliged to downgrade time. It sort of fits into their picture of the world. So time, first of all, is shriveled to little, little t. Mm -hmm. It becomes a pure quantity. Then it becomes one of four dimensions, and eventually it's folded into space-time, which in turn is folded into the geometry of what is. Yes, that's a perfectly respectable trajectory for physics, and it's delivered all sorts of useful things. Thank you, GPS. Thank you for all the technology that has come from physics. Thank you for the laptop computer on which I've written my books, etc. But actually, that has nothing to do with time as it is experienced. And we can't just dismiss the experience of time as an illusion for two reasons. One is it's, it's absolutely global, and illusions are things usually, that we don't share with others. And the other is it cannot be shaken off. And it can't be shaken off because there is something about time as we experience it humanly which touches on fundamental reality. So you, you, you're making an important qualification. You're saying time as we experience it. Now, we are um, um, evolved um, um, aspects of reality that are multiple generations of transformations from the, whatever was fundamental at the Big Bang and everything with the laws of physics. So why would it be the case that what we experience as, as such a derivative quantity uh, be a, uh, a window into what's fundamental? Uh, maybe what's fundamental is very different from what our experience is. If you look at the journey to the so-called fundamental, you can see it as a process of systematic impoverishment. <laughs> if you reduce time to a quantity of itself, if you reduce time to little c, to the amount of itself, mm. then of course you're going to lose all sorts of aspects of time. You can do things to little t you wouldn't dream of doing to a bargain break weekend. You can multiply it by itself. You can put it under space. It creates velocity and so on. But time as it is experienced as it is inescapably experienced. Experienced by physicists, by the way, just as much as it is by sure, you and sure, I. Sure. Such, <clears throat> such, such time cannot be overcome. And in fact, if we didn't have time as we experienced it, then it, physics wouldn't be possible. You couldn't actually get to CERN to do the experiments. Just as if reality was identical with quantum reality, you wouldn't have the equipment to generate quantum theory. But still physicists would say that our experience is, is the superficial reality. It's not the deeper reality. The deeper reality is we don't know what and we have to discern it. And uh, physicists would say that, that time is the illusion when events, um, there are different events, that, 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 it, it, that if there were no events, there'd be no time. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, how, do you, how do you get below that argument? Because uh, uh, it, it says, you know, we, we have no understanding of uh, how in a, um, in a neutron, 99% of the, 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 the mass is, is just uh, energy of, 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 of the gluons and, and quarks sort of uh, moving around and it's virtually empty. We have no, that's, that's completely counterintuitive. So time as well. It seems to me that if you think physics is the final statement, indeed the comprehensive statement of everything that, that is the case, then indeed, if you're a sincere physicist, you're left with believing that nothing happens. <laughs> In the four dimensional <laughs> block universe, nothing happens. So Einstein isn't born. CERN isn't built, nothing actually happens. It's all there to begin with. Well, it's either all there to begin with, 
or, and it's not very clear, yeah. whether it's never come into being anyway. Yeah. That is to say, you be have... Begin was a bad word because be there's no beginning and no end. It's just all there. But if, 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 as it were, the physical story of time were the complete story about time, then physics would not be possible. That surely is a knockdown answer to those who want to say that physics is the final explanation of what is truly real. Uh, 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 but those are at different, working at different levels. Uh, the level of how the physicist works is a product of how the human brain and, and, and our interaction with the world works, and that's how physics would dis discover things. Um, and they are, there is a sequence of events there. Grant all of that. I'm not sure if I'm defending your argument or attacking it. I well, can't it's tell. It's interesting. What, what, that, that argument would essentially be saying, out of a series of illusions, mobilizing illusory objects, and illusory subjects, we arrive at the truth. I find that a rather extraordinary claim. <laughs> uh, so how would you then, to understand the full richness of time, what are the components that you would stack on the table and say, here's what I need to build an understanding of time? There's one that's almost invisible, which I want to leave to the end because it's the most elusive. But first of all, we have to recognize of time, there is location, there is duration, and there is order. So time has already those three dimensions, okay. none of which, by the way, are captured by the notion of T. Secondly, there is clearly, as well as the order of before and after and so on, there, are, there is tense time, which is real. We are really here now. The memories I have of things that happened yesterday, if they're accurate, then there is something corresponding to them. My anticipation of what's going to happen in the future is well-founded in the sense that things continue to be, there are ongoing processes and so on. For example, it is well-founded that this room we're sitting in is going to be here in five minutes' time. So we have a past, a present, and a future, which, by the way, is very central to something we really do, which I hope we can discuss, which is of performing free actions, agency. Okay, so that, that's, that would be derivative of what, from what time is, but let's concentrate on time. So that must mean that you believe that only the present is really real, the past doesn't exist except in our memory, the future is yet to come, so the, what is real is this fleeting, evanescent period of time, people don't even know how to estimate it, a tenth of a second, how do we keep things at the present, what is the real, not just our perception of, of it, but what is the, the, the real, it's, it seems very, very uh, uh, small, so that, that, that's what you would believe to be real, perfectly acceptable position that many people take, uh, many physicists do not. I don't think that is my position. I mean, I'm not a presentist. The presentist said, only that which is present yeah. is real. Well, if they mean is present, well, of course, that's just a truism. <laughs> but of course, the present itself draws on a present past, which is explicitly past, and it points towards a present future, which is explicitly future. We have a sense of the past that informs the, the present, and we have a sense of the future that indicates where the present's going. So even my now is impregnated by past and by future. It, it's influenced, but it, 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 is, uh, it, it has to do with an integration in our, in our brains about more, bringing more those... More influenced. I mean, influence suggests that there's merely a causal effect yes, of the past right, on the present. Right, but right, the present, right. the past, as it were, is explicitly present. So I am aware of the past in its own right. And of course, the past must be real if we're going to differentiate between true statements about the past and false statements about the past. Sure, it's what sure. philosophers call the grounding problem. And, and uh, the past cannot be changed. The past uh, cannot be changed. So it is true that Socrates was an Athenian, and it's untrue that Socrates was a Liverpudlian. <laughs> now, if, there was no, if the past had no standing at all, then there would be no way of differentiating between the first statement being true and the second statement being false. As they say, truth supervenes on being, so the past must have some kind of being. And therefore the past must be fundamentally differentiated from the future because even though they both are not present, they are not present in radically different ways. And, and the banal thing to say about the future, of course, it's as yet undetermined. It has, however, constraints. For example, this room has a future in five minutes, which is greatly constrained by its present now. Mm -hmm. I don't expect mm -hmm. these tables to be absent. I hope you'll still be here in five minutes' time. I hope St. Andrew's University will still be here in five, five minutes' time. So the future is very constrained, 
by stable objects, ongoing processes. What is not determined in the future are events. I find it fascinating that two aspects of human knowledge uh, which are radically opposed to each other uh, on all uh, epistemological, ontological grounds uh, uh, would come together on only the point that the future is, is real uh, now. The block universe, Einsteinian, uh, uh, four-dimensional, Minkowski uh, approach, and theists who believe that God has determined the future and God knows the future in mm -hmm. some way. That's a whole other kind of discussion that one could spend millennia on, as, as people have here at St. Andrews. Mm -hmm. um, so those two groups to get together, the future is, uh, uh, is, is set in some way. I believe the future is real for the reasons that I've given, but I don't believe it's determined. So in other words, basically, I can see the future, but it does no work. In other words, that which is actually in the future hasn't happened in okay. that sense. So in other words, particular events, singular events, have not yet happened. And there's the possibility of heading them off shaping them and so on. But events in the past do work in the present? Ha they do, are able to do work in the present versus events in the future which do not? Is that what you're saying? They most certainly do. For example, my statement that Socrates was an Athenian was clearly influenced by the fact that Socrates was an Athenian. Right. Uh, but the fact that uh, you um, may go home to Manchester uh, tonight uh, isn't that has some of those same characteristics uh, that Socrates was an Athenian? I don't think so, because you've used the word may, may yeah. which is conditional, possibility, and so on. Right. So the future is full of possibilities. Mm -hmm. The past is Fixed. a plenum of actualities. Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so h how do we go further f f from that in, in explicating your understanding of time? I think we've got to look at the phenomenology of time. And we begin with the present, not because it's the easiest. It turns out to be at least as complicated as the other two, and very slippery, because it's at once elusive and inescapable. <laughs> but take the con concept of now, which, by the way, physicists cannot cope with, as Einstein mourned. Yeah. The concept of now is a very complicated concept. It certainly isn't a durationless instant. Any moment that I'm in now, as it were, is a moment impregnated by the past and reaching towards the future. That's sort of standard phenomenology. But the, the now has got a multitude of features within it. For example, what is its scope? Because it's true to say this minute is now, today is now, mm. this year is now. Mm -hmm. Now, in other words, is a kind of hinge uh, which, or a center of some kind of circle of temporal awareness, which I carry with me at any given time. I'm not rooted in a nanosecond, for example. I'm not even rooted uh, in the few seconds. What I'm saying at the moment itself draws on the past, reaches towards the future. So my now is a very fat now. It isn't that kind of now that is either a sharp line dividing the past and present, or worse still, a durationless instant as physicists. Your thick now is uh, very elegant, very artistic. I, I love hearing it, but it doesn't comport with the psychological reality. Uh, psychologists can study uh, and, and get my sense of when I'm saying now what our perceptions are. It's less than a second, maybe 200 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, something like that. I mean, I just said the word now a second or two ago, and that's, that's out of my, my real now. It might be my artistic now, which I appreciate, but, uh, but there is this very specific psychological period of time that if that's the only thing that's real, that's what we have to face. I don't think it's an artistic now. I think actually it's something much more holy than that. It's actually a lived now. It's the now that we, you and I are in. We couldn't possibly have a conversation uh, that consisted basically of um, an extended instance of time. We wouldn't have a conversation. It wouldn't amount to anything that's coherent. When you referred back to the word now that you just used, it's available to you in this now. That's how your now becomes so fat. That's why you can live in a day as well as in a second. The reason now shrinks in the gaze of psychology is the experiments are designed to so impoverish consciousness that it can be measured and looked at. But of course, impoverished con consciousness will have a dimensionless or tiny now. But real everyday life has a great fat now, the now of this minute, of this day, even of this week sometimes.
When physics tries to analyze time, uh, it does it in a way that's uh, different than our current perceptions. Um, how, how, do you, how do you articulate the physics understanding of time with our perceptions? Well, I feel it falls very short of what time is. And one of the reasons it does that is it takes for granted things like clocks. As Einstein himself said, clocks fit very awkward, awkwardly into the general theory of relativity, the very fact that there are things called clocks, that there is telling the time, locating things in time. There's nothing in the physical world that would actually connect an event with a particular time, even less connecting particular times with other times in a whole system, mm. a coordinate system of space and time. In other words, physics cannot accommodate the fact of the physical gaze on the world.